Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Rogers, a member of the Arizona Library Association Professional Development Committee, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you're unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email or on the screen. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use this data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit www.azla.org for additional information. The Professional Development Committee is seeking proposals for our 2023 webinars. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your webinar follow-up email. I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by AZLA Professional Development Committee on March 9th. Join us for the next generation, building relationships and equitable spaces with teens. Presented by Diana Man Manassi and Kayoshi Park. Diana and Kayoshi are passionate about ensuring teens receive the best service possible. They have worked together in public libraries, improving policies and training staff to feel confident and excited about working with this age group. Throughout their presentation, they will ask staff to look at how their biases may impact their teen customers, explain how to improve teen services, and give ideas on how to design equitable teen spaces. Registration for this webinar is posted to the AZLA calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your follow-up email. And now I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Karina Wilhelm, Ellen Meisinger, and Shell Pacheco for their presentation, Coloring Between the Walls, Using Art to Expand Patron Consciousness, Create Connections, and Provide Beauty. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. Welcome, I'm so glad uh, that you were all able to come to our webinar today. Um, I am Karina Wilhelm, and I'm going to be talking about uh, using art in libraries and my work on the nine year collaboration uh, between the ASU Library and ASU School of Art. This is the Creative Cartography Art Exhibition Series. Um, Real quick, before we start, though, I do want to take a moment to mention that this started out as a conference proposal um, with myself and my colleague, Jackie Young. And uh, Jackie is the curator of the Vault Gallery at the ASU Downtown Phoenix campus. And Jackie had other um, commitments and wasn't able to particip participate today. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about her artwork, her work with the Vault Gallery. Um, but she had a lot more that she was going to share. So to get started, let me, 
All right, so today for my portion of the webinar, I'll be starting out with the background of the Creative Cartography Collaboration, how ASU students have used the library for this project, uh, the potential broader use for library materials and art, and some examples of displaying art in library galleries. So I'm currently the manager of the ASU Design and the Arts Library. I graduated from ASU in 2006 with a degree in art history. Um, but I had been working as a student worker in what was then the map collection at ASU Library. And uh, right as I graduated, a part-time staff position opened up and then I got that and then a full-time staff position and I became the map specialist uh, for quite a number of years. Um, this is an image of the old uh, map collection. Um, I'm gonna go to another image of the map collection. We had a very large facility um, that you can see here in the Noble Science and Engineering Library. And this is a picture of the intro to geology classes that used the, um, the map collection in the past for their hometown geology lab. So as you can see, it's a very large space, but the collection housed over 200,000 maps and aerial photographs. And we just had too many maps, sometimes six or seven or eight copies of the exact same USGS topographic map. Same map, same edition, just many, many copies. And we just couldn't house all of the maps. And also our map librarian had accepted a donation of topographic maps. So we just had too much. And in 2014, um, a decision was made to withdraw some of those duplicate copies um, and to not accession all of the donation that we had received. We weren't giving away all of the maps, just the ones that we had an excess of. But we had a lot of maps we were getting rid of. Um, I offered these maps to other library uh, institutions. Um, and a few were accepted, but not many. Um, other libraries uh, that are federal depositories already had most of these maps and they were also available online. So there just wasn't really an incentive for um, libraries to accept these maps. So um, occasionally in the past, we'd have art students who would come to the library and ask if they could have maps for their, uh, for their artwork. And normally we don't just give away library collections. So usually the answer would be no, um, but faced with stacks of maps, um, I decided to offer the maps to uh, the ASU School of Art. And I didn't know any of the faculty um, in the, the studio art department. Um, so I emailed the entire department with the hope that someone would take me up on this. And Professor Ellen Murray Meisinger emailed me back asking if she could take some. And I said, yes. And she brought a cart ready to fill up. And um, when she visited, I mentioned that we had recently been given some map, uh, some exhibit cases. And they were just sitting empty because maps are really large and very difficult to display. And we both kind of said, hmm, wouldn't it be nice to have some cartographic art? put in these exhibit cases. So Professor Meisinger decided to create an assignment for her art on paper class. And with it, she challenged students to create artwork with maps. And then we had the plan to display their artwork in the library at the end of the semester. And Ellen will talk a little bit more about the actual assignment in just a moment. Um, but my initial, um, my initial goal with this project was simply to fill those exhibit cases, as you can see here, but also to give students an opportunity to exhibit their art, to show their art. Um, and the first iteration was in 2014, the Memories and Movement exhibition, which you can see here in those cases. The installation day was the first day that many of the students had ever been to the science library, let alone the map collection. And after that first year, we decided to collaborate again, um, but we decided that in the future, we would have the class visit the map collection before the installation day. So, um, and there were several reasons for having them visit the map collection. For one thing, it was a great opportunity for interdisciplinary work. 
to have art students come to the science library. Um, it was also a way to make sure that the students understood the maps that they were working with, to make sure that they understood what they were looking at as they, they figured out what they wanted to do with, with their artwork. And finally, I love showing off library collections. So it was a great opportunity. So here we are back in the, the map collection, uh, showing off some of those um, some of those maps and other materials. And I will show a couple of examples of students kind of being inspired by some of the things I showed them in just a moment. Um, but in 2016, the map collection became the Map and Geospatial Hub under the new director, Matthew Toro. And it was decided that when Hayden Library, the main library, reopened after a big renovation, that uh, the Map and Geospatial Hub would move there, but with a much, much smaller footprint. And this caused us to need to give away more maps. And again, most of which were duplicate copies. Um, but this allowed the creative cartography collaboration to go on longer than that initial donation of maps would have allowed. And it also gave us an opportunity to give um, Professor Meisinger some of the geologic maps. And these are very colorful uh, maps that show rock types. And so it created some interesting opportunities for the art students. And then for the past two years, uh, for the past two years, in addition to my presentation of the physical maps, um, Matthew Toro, as you can see here on the left, um, has talked about creating maps with geographic information systems, or GIS. And we've also had the director of the ASU Library Makerspace uh, talk about some of the resources that are available through the Makerspace and the types of services available to the students. And our, our last presenter is one of those students who took advantage of some of these library resources, and she'll tell us about that in a few minutes. Um, but with this project, I really wanted students to think about library materials in a new way, um, more than just a way to get information. So here, um, going back to 2015, um, we had started out with those exhibit cases. Um, that we had been given. And then, um, so here is the 2015 Order and Chaos exhibit. But in addition to that, we wanted to have more space for more artwork. Um, so we also used foam board and pinned the artwork to the foam board and had them displayed across the top of the map, map cases in the old map collection. Um, with this project, we have also encouraged students to um, arrange the artwork in the exhibitions themselves and to also create um, and write their own artist statements. So with this one, uh, we had purchased movable display boards that then the students were able to um, pin their artwork directly to those display boards. So just another way of displaying the artwork. You can see that here. Uh, this is the place and space exhibition on those exhibit boards. And then the last two years, we've had it a slightly different area. Um, we have had it on the second floor of the Noble Library. And this has given us a more professional hanging system. So here we use um, foam board again, pinned the students' artwork to the foam board, and then used a walker display system, which are those rods hanging down that we were then able to clip the artwork to. And I have a few more images of the students installing their artwork. Um, the past two years, like I mentioned, we were able to give the students uh, some of the ge geologic maps, the very colorful ones that show rocks and rock formations. And so for the past two years, the students have created two pieces one being a three-dimensional piece made out of geologic maps, and then a two-dimensional piece made from the topographic maps. And this is the installation of one of the three-dimensional piece um, exhibitions. And here is the students um, installing some of the two-dimensional pieces. So those have been um, several of the ways that we have displayed some of the student artwork in this collaboration. Um, I did want to show um, a couple examples. Oh, and we have had 
over 100 students uh, exhibit in the library through this. So it's been a really great, great way to um, bring those students into the library and collaborate with them. Um, I did wanna show a few examples of um, artwork that was maybe influenced by some of the maps that I sh show um, during those class visits to the map collection or now the map and geospatial hub. Um, on the left is a map that I love to pull out uh, from the collection. It is a map of Mexico City or Tenochtitlan, um, but it's a very pictorial map. It has a lot of um, symbols of um, Aztec settlements. And uh, ASU student Cora Talkington um, used this as an inspiration for hers to create symbols for her artwork on the right. Um, this next one is kind of sort of a map. It's a map of Tempe, but it's really illustrations of buildings um, around Tempe, but laid out in a roughly geographic um, uh, layout. And so I kind of have students look at this one because it's not really a map, but it kind of is. Um, and last year or two years ago, artist James Guthrie took a map of Holbrook, Arizona, and uh, kind of took some inspiration from that Tempe map and used it to create his own artwork. And then in addition to this, um, in addition to all of the exhibitions, um, I, to create some permanence for this experience, I decided to create a library guide um, to be kind of a digital exhibition, a digital, digital exhibit of all of the artwork um, that has been created over the years. And I wanted a place that students could link to, to say, look, I've shown my artwork. So I used um, gallery boxes that you can see here um, so that people could scroll through all of the artwork and um, read the artist statements and really you know, experience some of the artwork. Um, and this whole project has been about bringing students into the library, having them consider how they think about library materials and giving them opportunities to create. Now, there are a lot of ways that projects like this can be implemented into other libraries. There are sometimes institutional limitations, I know. Um, when I've talked about this project with some colleagues, a few have mentioned that at their libraries, they have very strict, um, strict rules about withdrawal and disposal of library materials. And I would note that at the beginning of this collaboration, um, some of those original maps that were given to Professor Meisinger were never even part of the collection. Um, so perhaps if you have collections policies um, and donations don't meet those criteria for addition to the library, maybe they can be used for a project like this. So this is the creative cartography collaboration. And we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, with our other presenters. But real quick, um, since Jackie Young, the curator of the ASU Downtown Phoenix Campus Library Vault Gallery was unable to um, participate today, I did wanna briefly mention some of her work. So the ASU uh, Downtown Phoenix Campus Library is located in the, in the basement of one of the buildings. And it has no windows, it's kind of gloomy, um, but it is located close to Roosevelt Row, which is a thriving artist community in Phoenix. And so the decision was made to turn what was once the bank vault of the First National Bank into the vault gallery. And um, Jackie Young, like I said, is the current curator of it. And she works really hard to bring local artists into the library, as well as um, show artwork that engages and educates the patrons, the students who use the library. And the current exhibition is artwork by um, Robert Palmer, who is an ASU alumni. And so this is a slightly different approach um, than the creative cartography. And there are many ways of bringing art into libraries. But whether you're repurposing library materials or showcasing more traditional artwork, um, art can be used to create meaningful, um, meaningful collaboration with the community. 
meaningful connections. Um, so I would like to turn the time over to Professor Ellen Murray Meisinger to talk about her part in this collaboration. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Karina. Uh, I'm Ella Mary Meisinger, Professor of Painting and Drawing uh, at the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts in the School of Art at ASU. And as Karina has told you, one of the classes I teach is art on paper. Um, for the last nine years, I have so enjoyed a collaboration with Karina in ASU Library, uh, working with a creative cartography, project and developing student art exhibitions from the discarded maps. In 1997, my personal connection with maps got a jump start with a chance meeting. I was invited to be the juror of the Rocky Mountain National Water Media Exhibition in Golden, Colorado. And since I was going to be in Golden for the better part of a week, one of the local arts organizations hosted a big outdoor party in my honor at the home of one of their members, a man by the name of Hal Shelton. Hal and I hit it off and started a lengthy conversation about color and space. I learned that Hal Shelton was a renowned cartographer who had helped pioneer the use of naturalistic color on shaded relief maps in the 1950s and 60s. He also, impressively enough, created the map that, uh, for NASA that landed the first man on the moon. As we were talking later in his studio and he was pulling out maps, I started thinking about maps and possibilities for integrating them into my own art practice and also my teaching. As a result of this chance meeting, I started gathering and collecting more information about maps. Here's the map on the left that Hal did of Italy and also a map of Florence, Italy showing an ideal city from about 1403. When Karina sent out an email to see if anybody wanted maps for that were being discarded by the library, I was absolutely primed to say yes. I loaded up a card, I totally remember this, with as many maps as it could hold. Primarily, I took Arizona topographic maps. I was thinking of the art on paper class, the maps were free paper and also a sustainable solution to student supplies. Most importantly, the maps were a way for students to understand more about where they were living and their relationship to place and environment. In 2014, one of the goals for the very first map assignment was simple, to be inspired by a map or maps how will you complete, complement or enhance a paper surface that already has topographic information? Working with visual information already on the page instead of a blank piece of paper really challenging stu challenges students to think outside of their typical way of starting an assignment and handling composition. Students were also required to write an artist statement and prepare a label. You can see also this assignment is primarily about the size of everything because we had very small cases, but I felt very fortunate that we had cases in the Noble Library to exhibit work. Here's some images from that first um, exhibition, Memories and Movement from 2014. In 2014, as I remember, art students in my classes were doing some amazing work, but it was rarely seen or exhibited outside of the art building. When Karina and I started talking about the possible exhibition in the Noble Science and Engineering Library cases, it was a perfect venue for art students' work to be seen by a wider and more diverse audience. I also found that the art on paper class was really excited about having their own student art exhibition. 
As a result, they took the map assignment very seriously and wanted to do well because they knew their work would be exhibited outside of the art building and seen by a larger audience. Here are some of the long-term benefits of the project in my estimation. It connects library patrons with art and creativity, increases awareness of interdisciplinary relationships between art and science, supports sustainability by repurposing maps and paper, and increases awareness of important library resources, specifically the map and geospatial hub, as well as uh, the new makerspace in Hayden Library. You will hear more about the makerspace from our next spe speaker, a student from 2022. Oops. Here's an example of the Order and Chaos Show from 2015. The theme for that year was Order and Chaos, as uh, Karina has mentioned. Each of the students uh, worked on two pieces on topographic maps. With that show, we started using themes that gave students the chance to work with opposites. Through Space and Time, in 2016 was the focus of the next exhibit. Some students, as you'll note on the left, left the map information at the bottom of the map to reveal its origins. Others decided to crop their maps. This was an opportunity to complete two solutions on a related theme. Here are three diverse solutions from the point of view show. The focus on the left is with cellular structures. In the center, it was more about being influenced by figure and color. And the third is dealing with really an interesting relationship with reclining figures. Place and space was a topic for the next year. Each student artist created two solutions again. Typically, there are about 18 to 20 students in the Art on Paper class. We decided to give the map assignment only in the fall semester, and that seemed to work best in terms of opening up a space for us to exhibit and also connecting with other things and other events that were happening with the map and geospatial hub. In 2019, uh, Old and New brought some original and very varied content to the show with nature being a popular subject as well as figure content. Ordering Chaos 2020 was the next scene. From forest fires to Black Lives Matter, we did not run out of subject matter at all or major events to draw from. I just want to mention that this really brought a personal reaction and response by many of the students to events that were happening around them. Have They had an opportunity to oftentimes select a personal topic that would fit into one of the themes for the year. Before uh, we moved uh, to the, um, from the Noble Library to Hayden Library with a map and geospatial hub, as Karina has mentioned, um, we sat down and we just picked through a lot of the geologic maps that were being withdrawn. They were so colorful and it really offered uh, an opportunity to do something special and to add to uh, the cartography project. And I want to show you just a couple of examples. Some of the work with geological maps from 2021 was truly stunning. Here's an example of one of those things. Uh, one of the students uh, took the geologic map and cut it into very uh, fine strips to make the corn kernels. 
and then actually took the rest of the map and dipped it in coffee so it would have a richer coloration and turned the whole thing into a wonderful 3D project. In 2021, also the students uh, were asked to think about additional materials along with the geologic paper maps. And here's a student who added some uh, actual moss to her animal to make it a little bit more uh, inventive and also to be able to work with new materials. This particular student was native Alaskan. Uh, we did not have an Alaska map. I actually offered to get her one from the hub, but she decided to go in a different direction. She took an Arizona map and superimposed the shape of Alaska as a background on the map and created her own combination, which was very fitting in terms of where she was living now and where she grew up. She also talked about the fact that her grandmother had passed away when she was a baby. So she'd not been able to be taught some of the traditions of her culture. So she used the geologic map as a way of honoring that by creating a, an Alaskan dance fan, a more traditional kind of fan than you would see her grandmother having uh, made. And then she added also feathers to the fan. Some of the additional benefits for students of the long-term project are really utilizing library resources for creative problem solving, and also that engagement with personal research. Practical experience in organizing and installing an art exhibition, exhibition credit to include on a resume, and an online record of accomplishment and success. And especially with what Karina has done with the library guides, participation in creating a new library online resource and teaching tool. In 2022, with the latest aberration of the project, Seek and Find exhibit, Students continue to work with the geologic maps as well as the topographic maps and adding additional materials, uh, eyelashes and the wig. And students continue to be inspired by the geologic maps in terms of doing really outstanding work with the 3D aspect of the project. You can see the eagle being used two-dimensionally and also three-dimensionally. And lastly, here's an example of a student work with finely pay, uh, cut paper um, leaves and actual leaves that have been uh, actually covered uh, to protect them and a three dimensional sculpture for the second part of the project where plexiglass has been used along with gold paper in addition to what you see with the maps. The last exhibit is actually going into 2023 now at the Fletcher Library at ASU West. Uh, it's available on the third floor and runs through March 4th and probably will be up another week or so was last we heard. So we invite you to drop by and see the show for yourselves or visit the ASU Library website and search for creative cartography to bring up the online library guide and see all of the amazing work that the students have done for nine years of the exhibition. Uh, in my estimation, the creative cartography project is a great example of ways library resources can be adapted and renewed for new audiences with collaboration, creativity, and imagination. Our next speaker, Shel Pacheco, uh, was one of the Art on Paper students who participated in the 2022 exhibit and used one of the newer resources of Hayden Library. And she's gonna talk a little bit about that experience. So I'll turn it over to Shel. Let me unshare my screen.
Okay, hello. Um, I was, uh, my name is Shel Pacheco. I was a student last semester when our theme was We Can Find, and my pieces were titled The Artist and the Muse. They were loosely based off of the process of seeking and finding inspiration as an artist and the self-sacrifice that it can sometimes take to merge yourself as an artist with your muse. Let me see. Okay, so um, when we were originally given this assignment, it was actually right after we were given an assignment to repurpose a book. So it kind of got us into the mindset of incorporating our art with different genres and different media. Um, we were told that our two dimensional piece would include a topographical map cut down to 18 by 24. And our three dimensional piece would include a colorful geographical map. So that was, it, the assignment basically came with its inspiration to start. This was the flyer that was sent out to us, which I absolutely love, so I had to include that. Um, this is the first time I've had a assignment that included a field trip. So our, my art brain was just buzzing with excitement to just be able to get out of the studio and really immerse myself in all my resources. Um, the Map and Geospatial Hub was an incredible experience. Um, Karina, I think, mentioned we got to meet Matthew, the, I believe he's the director of the Geospatial Hub. I could be wrong about that. But we learned about the GIS system that um, Karina had mentioned. We also learned a lot about the different technologies that they're using and the way they're scanning maps to be cataloged and put online. And we got to see all the in-person maps that they have. And it's just an incredible collection to be able to be immersed in. And next, we went to the makerspace. Um, the makerspace is this, this amazing setting. It's kind of like a fishbowl. You can walk around and see all these resources. And as an artist, it was really important for me to experience this part of the process. They um, have a tech lending opportunity. They have a, a visual audio studio. Uh, they have very advanced sewing machines. I had no idea that sewing could be so advanced. And they also have, um, as mentioned before, 3D printers. I had never heard or had access to 3D printers. So I knew that was something that I wanted to take advantage of immediately, even before I knew what I was going to do with this assignment. So um, my general, as I mentioned before, my general concept was uh, the artistic journey. And this is the artist statement I had for this part of my series, which is the 3D piece, the find part of the seek and find, I titled it the muse. The artistic journey of finding inspiration can be ignited within the most excruciating experiences. The decision to merge yourself as an artist within your art is an act of self-sacrifice that puts your heart on display for the world to see. So to start the 3D printing process, I had to take a 20 minute Zoom orientation that broke down the technology and the process and everything I needed to know to use the 3D print. I was guided to use a website called Thingiverse, which had pre-made models that I could use and transfer and submit it into the application so I wouldn't have to take the hours to create a model. Um, I felt very lucky that it took me about 20 minutes to submit the model and I just had to let the 3D print do the rest of the work. Uh, it took about three days for my print to be made. It was um, 682 layers of melted plastic and it was, and if you look at your fist, that's about the size of your heart and the heart actually printed out anatomically correct to size. It was about three and a half inches tall. Um, it was perfect. So I had to change my original concept, which was to paper mache with the geological map over the heart. And as soon as I saw the heart and how beautiful the, the 3D printer, which was the Makerspot fifth generation is the printer that I was able to use. The 3D printer just, it was immaculate. So I had to change my concept and I decided that the geological map would be incorporated on the, the way I display the piece. And I think it, turned out really well and actually went better with what the entire concept was 
as opposed to how I was originally going to do it. Uh, while waiting the three days for my 3D print to finish, I worked on a color study, which is just basically a general blueprint in a journal of what my plan of action is so that I don't have to overthink the colors I'm going to use or the composition of the piece. When I'm ready to put it on a map, I can just enjoy the process and know exactly the steps I'm going to take for that process. This, um, my two-dimensional piece was the seek part of the assignment and I titled it The Artist. The artist statement is kind of similar. The cost of being an artist is a mixture of chaos and art. Some of the greatest masterpieces come from self-sacrifice and heartbreak, all entangled within the journey to find inspiration. So during my, uh, my color study, I find reference photos. For this specific piece, I use reference photos of aerial yoga combined with ancient Mesoamerican art. Weird combination, but it worked out pretty good. The one of the questions that I really am thankful that Ellen brought up when we were originally assigned to this assignment is how will working on a map change your thinking process? And as an artist who's been an artist who's been in school for what feels like forever, I'm, I completely disregarded that question at first and I knew I was just going to approach it the way I would approach any assignment. But upon cropping down my map, I started doing pigment tests on the strips of map that I had cut off. And I ended up with a 1978 map. So when I would apply watercolor to the map directly, it would have a disintegrating or just not a pretty effect. So I realized I had to do a medium study as well as a color study. By medium study, what I mean is how am I gonna preserve the map underneath the pigment that I lay on top of the map? And I had to get very sciencey and I realized I had to come up with a formula for other mediums. And my final formula was a layer of watercolor transparent ground with the combination of a matte gel, which basically just created a seal for the map to be stronger. And I had to apply one layer at a time and have a lot of drying time in between. Because if I didn't let it dry, it would warp and typically with the way I work, I get my surface completely soaked with pigment. So it was a learning process as I went and I made sure to take pictures of every step just in case it didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. Um, the installation process was, I feel, besides the field trip, one of the most important parts of this entire assignment because of the pride that was involved in being able to be a part of every step of the process. So for our three-dimensional pieces, we were broken into groups of, I believe it was six to eight. And amongst ourselves, we had to determine how to display our, our labels, how to display each piece, what order, which way to face. So it really was a collaborative effort amongst ourselves as creators and not only speaking up for ourselves, but acknowledging when it was important for being able to switch an idea or switch around objects so that it looked together like a good show. And for our two dimensional pieces, we lined up everything as a class and pretty much just hung what looked good where. And we were very fortunate to have help when we were doing that. Um, overall, this entire experience, I personally feel was the most holistic artistic experience I've had in university. And what do I mean by that is it did bring together not only the assignment, but the resources and where we were able to access the resources and the types of resources that I was able to access. My, my brain was able to not only be in art mode, but use technology such as the 3D print and being able to use a surface such as this 1978 map it just completely broadened my ideas and expanded my inspiration as an artist. And I am so grateful for this experience because it's just opened more doors than I ever imagined could be opened. Um, in addition, I, I mentioned this, but the installation process was so important as a class because, I mean, if you look at our picture in the center, we're all just beaming with pride because for one, it was towards the end of the semester, so we're all tired, but we can see the hard work that we put in and now we get to just breathe and see everything come together. And it was just a really 
beautiful experience that I'm extremely grateful for. Um, to finish, I just have some of my contact information. I have my website, my Instagram, and an email that I use for work. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to speak today about my experience. Um, Karina, I'm gonna pass it to you. Thank you so much, Shell and Ellen. Um, that was great. I'm going to share one more slide. Um, this is just some of our contact information. One second. There we go. And um, so as you've heard, um, this has been a really great experience. I think a lot of different ways to make people, make these students more aware of library resources. Think of library resources in a different way, bring art into libraries, just a lot of different aspects to this project. Um, and also, I, I'm so glad that Shell talked about the uh, makerspace because there are so many resources in addition to the Map and Geospatial Hub, in addition to the makerspace, that a lot of times students just aren't even aware of. Um, we had a few students who were thrilled to see the makerspace, but they were graduating in a month. And that breaks my heart when people don't know about the resources that they have. So this was just a really great way of um, helping the students know about some of these resources and think about library resources in a different way. So just to conclude, there are a few more weeks to see the 2022 exhibition at the ASU West Campus. And uh, this will be, 2023 will be our 10th anniversary of this collaboration. So we hope that maybe you can join us later in the year as we do our annual exhibition. And um, it's just been a real pleasure being able to share this, uh, share our experiences with you. And um, we just think it's so important to raise awareness of library resources and how art can be combined with those library resources. So thank you so much. And thank you all. What an inspiring and beautiful presentation. Um, and so questions, uh, we have a few. I am gonna, that's a great place to leave off, Karina, uh, when you talk about your 10 years of this collaboration. And I just wanna go back to, Matt made a comment and he said, I'm, I'm impressed by the longevity of this super cool collaboration. And I would like to all just kind of ask, like, what do you think that's um, due to? Like what, what really has, because many times people start programs, um, but it's really hard to continue them as staff changes or as others change. And, and so what, what do you attribute the longevity to? On my part is I love art. <laughs> and I had been working with maps for years and years, and I love maps. But I also really wanted to bring a little bit of art into my position. So in my part, it was just really enjoying working with Ellen, uh, working with these student artists who are amazing. And, um, and I've changed positions. I'm, I'm no longer working at the Map and Geospatial Hub. So, you know, I have been very grateful that current supervisors have supported me in uh, continuing on. Um, but I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Ellen? Um, sure. Um, one of the things I think for me has been uh, the really positive response to the exhibition from the students. And that has been ongoing every year. I think we've, I've just been surprised and really proud of what they've been able to achieve. And also uh, uh, practical things that they've learned through the assignment. And uh, Karina is just lovely to work with. We have a really wonderful working relationship and I've learned so much from the collaboration about things I probably uh, would never have learned about. So it's been uh, a really positive for me experience uh, as well. And Shell, anything to, to add to? I know that you're part of this exhibit, um, uh, but do you have any thoughts about it continuing on for, for future students? Or? I think it works in before this class, I did not know the resources that I had access to. Like Karina said, I was one of those students who a month before graduation, I found out about all, all these resources. And so I feel like it's just a really important, probably the most important assignment I had as a student. And I think it is something that is important to continue because it works. It's such 
we have a senior show, but it's nothing like being fully immersed in not only this the installation process, but the resources you have as a student and a student of the School of Arts. So it just works and it should continue for another decade for sure. That should be um, the motto for it. It works. Like it's, it is so great and well put. Thank you. Um, another question we had is, do the students sign an artist agreement with the library? So, you know, you had mentioned the archive, Karina. Um, will those images be all digitally recorded and the even the 3D objects like digitally preserved? Um, and then do those go back to the students? Like exactly how does that work? So the students um, at the end of like when they're done creating their artwork, they all submit images of their artwork to me. And then I add them to the library guide. I mean, it's not anything fancy. It's just the library guide. But um, we have been able to uh, kind of preserve them that way. It's not perfect. And we haven't done um, agreements. I don't know. I've never actually been uh, asked to do that. So um, that may be something that's necessary for, for some uh, collaborations um, elsewhere, but uh, we haven't actually done that. Um, we have talked about maybe moving this over to like the ASU Digital Archive, um, but so far we've just kept it as a library guide. That might change in the future, but yes, we have kind of, I've held on to all of the images and then put them, put them up so everybody can view them. Thank you for, for sharing that. And also, um, Shell, I don't know if you saw the, the chat uh, string, but she also wanted to thank you for being so detailed about what you learned and, and um, how, it, how it will help you in your future. Um, another question was, has there been, um, from Cameron, has there been anything done in conjunction with the National GIS Day? Oh, that's a great question. Um, for uh, the Mapping Geospatial Hub in the past has done some GIS Day events, and this has corresponded with um, when we had the exhibit up uh, for a couple of those years. So um, that has been really nice. And also I showed that image of the um, Intro to Geology Labs. Um, we, we kind of timed this exhibit so it would be on display when all these students were coming in, when we had the GIS Day. Um, we haven't done anything with GIS Day in the past couple of years, uh, but maybe sometime in the future, we'll see. <laughs> That's we had great. a nice open house one year for mm -hmm. GIS where we were really bringing in uh, people who were visiting ASU for the first time, as well as a number of students uh, were hosting that event, as I recall. Oh, that's right. We did. We had uh, the GIS Day event, and we actually had some of the students kind of that were on exhibit how like stand there and talk about their artwork uh, with people as they came by and that was really nice. Oh, that's a neat idea and which goes into yeah. an, uh, another question we got is what reactions do you get in general from like just general library patrons um, passing through this space and and sort of what has been uh, your anecdotal reaction. Anecdotal reaction. Um, it's always been very positive. Um, I get a lot of reaction from library coworkers rather than like people. Well, I'm no longer working in the Noble Library, so I don't get the people passing by oh, I like your exhibit, though we have had that in the past for sure. Um, but we have a lot of uh, coworkers who've been really glad to have this go on. Um, yeah, I don't know. Ellen, have you had anybody reach out to you? Uh, I have not, not recently, no. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think one other thing that happens is obviously uh, the students are publicizing this on their Instagram or their Facebook page. They're bringing their parents to see uh, what they've accomplished and usually their roommates as well. So I think it's brought in that regard more people into the library that maybe ordinarily wouldn't be visiting ASU. And I have to say, I have a teenager who is very interested in art and is very much an artist. And um, my teenager has grown up basically since they were five, seeing this exhibit year after year and uh, was very disappointed when uh, they couldn't see it um, in 2022 and is excited to see it at the West Campus. So just anecdotally, 
um, my teenager loves it. And is it, um, has it grown in being publicized? Like, is it publicized outside of, um, you know, like just the way you're sharing um, with sort of the ASU com community at large? Um, yes, so we've, um, we've done various things to publicize it. Um, let's see, what have we done? We've sent it out in um, library, or not library, but the student newsletters. Uh, made sure that other students were um, aware of it. Uh, we've done like, we did a reception one year um, that we advertised to um, the broader ASU community. I think we had one year on our fifth anniversary, it was written up by the ASU news. And so we had a really nice, nice turnout that year. So we've had different things that we've done different years. And do, will these, uh, one of the questions was, will these assignments and art pieces physically be seen at other ASU campuses? Like, does it ever travel? Have you ever thought of having it be a traveling show? This is the first year that we've done that. It's always been at the Noble Library, uh, but this year we did move it from Noble over to the West Campus. Um, but it's the first year that we've done that. That's great. Um, Another question from Anne, are maps available for elementary schools or made available for uh, those outside of ASU? Um, the map collection or the map and geospatial hub has moved to its permanent location and is no longer actively giving away maps. Though I will say um, we gave a ton of maps to, I believe it's called the Art Resource Center, the ARC in Tempe. Um, which um, provides art supplies to teachers in the area. And they had, they were super thrilled to receive maps and they had all kinds of stuff. They had fabric and all. So there are resources out there. Um, we are not actively giving away maps at this point though, unfortunately. And um, we're closing in on time, but just to share, Erin um, uh, popped in a, great idea for a future topic to use the FCC maps regarding the broadband equity funding dispersal and connect to digital inclusion, um, which also goes to another comment that was shared um, up at NAU. They're putting up large screens on walls to display student artwork, um, including the name of the class and professor, um, so that it helps students become interested in joining these experiences that, that Shell and other students have had. That's great. Yeah, I think there's so many different ways that something like this could be implemented. Yeah, you've given us um, so much inspiration. Any final thoughts that you would like to share um, and experiences that uh, you would like to share with our audience today? Um, I just, I am so grateful that we were able to come today. and. I'm really thankful that um, that Ellen and Shell were able to join us because I feel like it's a great way to show that people use libraries for a lot of different ways and a lot of different uh, reasons. And um, I think it's been really great to hear from each of them how this experience has helped them and think more about the libraries. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Ellen? I, I think that is the, the main thing is uh, if, if anything, uh, I can see the project continuing because we have new resources now and we're reaching a broader audience. So I, I see, I hope with Karina's help that we'll be able to continue this into another year and beyond. And Shell, any last thoughts? Just thank you so much for allowing me to be here today and speak from a art student's perspective. And I just want to thank Ellen and Karina for the opportunity and the assignment and the amazing assignment. I really want to thank Shell uh, for donating her time and energy. Uh, you know, it's just so uh, much of an honor to work with you. And I wish you actually so many good things in future as you move on with your art career. 
So it's been uh, really a pleasure to be able to have you chat about what your experience was like. That was beautifully said. Thank you so much. It will be exciting to see uh, where your art uh, takes you. What beautiful work, Shell. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and thank you all for being with us today. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar and have a wonderful, beautiful, art-filled day. <laughs>